Chapter 5 The Reconstruction Period The years from 1867 to 1878, I think, may be called the period of Reconstruction. This included the time that I spent as a student at Hampton and as a teacher in West Virginia. During the whole of the Reconstruction period, two ideas were constantly agitating the minds of the colored people, or at least the minds of a large part of the race. One of these was the craze for Greek and Latin learning, and the other was a desire to hold office. It could not have been expected that a people who had spent generations in slavery, and before that generations in the darkest hedonism, could at first form any proper conception of what an education meant. In every part of the South, during the Reconstruction period, schools, both day and night, were filled to overflowing with people of all ages' conditions, some being as far along in age as sixty and seventy years. The ambition to secure an education was most praiseworthy and encouraging. The idea, however, was too prevalent that, as soon as one secured a little education, in some unexplainable way, he would be free from most of the hardships of the world, and, at any rate, could live without manual labor. There was a further feeling that a knowledge, however little, of the Greek and Latin languages would make one a very superior human being, something bordering almost on the supernatural. I remember that the first colored man whom I saw who knew something about foreign languages impressed me at that time as being a man of all others to be envied. Naturally, most of our people who received some little education became teachers or preachers. While among these two classes, there were many capable, earnest, godly men and women, still a large proportion took up teaching or preaching as an easy way to make a living. Many became teachers who could do little more than write their names. I remember there came into our neighborhood one of this class who was in search of a school to teach, and the question arose while he was there as to the shape of the earth and how he would teach the children concerning this subject. He explained his position in the matter by saying that he was prepared to teach that the earth was either flat or round, according to the preference of a majority of his patrons. The ministry was the profession that suffered most, and still suffers, though there has been great improvement on account of not only ignorant, but in many cases, immoral men who claimed that they were called to preach. In the earlier days of freedom, almost every colored man who learned to read would receive a call to preach within a few days after he began reading. At my home in West Virginia, the process of being called to the ministry was a very interesting one. Usually the call came when the individual was sitting in church. Without warning, the one called would fall upon the floor as if struck by a bullet and would lie there for hours, speechless and motionless. Then the news would spread all through the neighborhood that this individual had received a call. If he were inclined to resist the summons, he would fall or be made to fall a second or third time. In the end, he always yielded to the call. While I wanted an education badly, I confess that in my youth I had a fear that when I had learned to read and write well, I would receive one of these calls, but for some reason my call never came. When we add the number of wholly ignorant men who preached or exhorted to that of those who possessed something of an education, it can be seen at a glance that the supply of ministers was large. In fact, some time ago I knew a certain church that had a total membership of about 200, and 18 of that number were ministers. But, I repeat, in many communities in the South, the character of the ministry is being improved, and I believe that within the next two or three decades, a very large proportion of the unworthy ones will have disappeared. The calls to preach, I am glad to say, are not nearly so numerous now as they were formerly, and the calls to some industrial occupation are growing more numerous. The improvement that has taken place in the character of the teachers is even more marked 
than in the case of the ministers. During the whole of the Reconstruction period, our people throughout the South looked to the federal government for everything, very much as a child looks to its mother. This was not unnatural. The central government gave them freedom, and the whole nation had been enriched for more than two centuries by the labor of the Negro. Even as a youth, and later in manhood, I had the feeling that it was cruelly wrong in the central government, at the beginning of our freedom, to fail to make some provision for the general education of our people, in addition to what the states might do, so that the people would be the better. Prepared for the duties of citizenship. It is easy to find fault, to remark what might have been done, and perhaps, after all, and under all the circumstances, those in charge of the conduct of affairs did the only thing that could be done at the time. Still, as I look back now over the entire period of our freedom, I cannot help feeling that it would have been wiser if some plan could have been put in operation which would have made the possession of a certain amount of education or property, or both, a test for the exercise of the franchise and a way provided by which this test should be made to apply honestly and squarely to both the white and black races. Though I was but little more than a youth during the period of Reconstruction, I had the feeling that mistakes were being made, and that things could not remain in the condition that they were in then very long. I felt that the Reconstruction policy, so far as it related to my race, was in a large measure on a false foundation, was artificial and forced. In many cases, it seemed to me that the ignorance of my race was being used as a tool with which to help white men into office, and that there was an element in the North which wanted to punish the Southern white men by forcing the Negro into positions over the heads of the Southern whites. I felt that the Negro would be the one to suffer for this in the end. Besides, the general political agitation drew the attention of our people away from the more fundamental matters of perfecting themselves in the industries at their doors and in securing property. The temptations to enter political life were so alluring that I came very near yielding to them at one time, but I was kept from doing so by the feeling that I would be helping in a more substantial way by assisting in the laying of the foundation of the race through a generous education of the hand, head, and heart. I saw colored men who were members of the state legislatures and county officers who, in some cases, could not read or write and whose morals were as weak as their education. Not long ago, when passing through the streets of a certain city in the South, I heard some brick masons calling out from the top of a two-story brick building on which they were working for the governor to hurry up and bring up some more bricks. Several times I heard the command, Hurry up, governor. Hurry up, governor. My curiosity was aroused to such an extent that I made inquiry as to who the governor was, and soon found that he was a colored man who at one time had held the position of lieutenant governor of his state. But not all the colored people who were in office during Reconstruction were unworthy of their positions by any means. Some of them, like the late Senator B. K. Bruce, Governor Pinchback, and many others, were strong, upright, useful men. Neither were all the class designated as carpetbaggers dishonorable men. Some of the, like ex-Governor Bullock of Georgia, were men of high character and usefulness. Course. The colored people, so largely without education and wholly without experience in government, made tremendous mistakes, just as any people similarly situated would have done. Many of the Southern whites have a feeling that, if the Negro is permitted to exercise his political rights now to any degree, the mistakes of the Reconstruction period will repeat themselves. I do not think this would be true because the Negro is a much stronger and wiser man than he was 35 years ago, and he is fast learning the lesson that he cannot afford to act in a manner that will alienate his southern white neighbors from him. More and more, I am convinced that the final solution of the political end of our race problem 
will be for each state that finds it necessary to change the law bearing upon the franchise, to make the law apply with absolute honesty and without opportunity for double-dealing or evasion to both races alike. Any other course, my daily observation in the South convinces me, will be unjust to the Negro, unjust to the white man, and unfair to the rest of the states in the Union, and will be, like slavery, a sin that at some time we shall have to pay for. In the fall of 1878, after having taught school in Malden for two years, and after I had succeeded in preparing several of the young men and women, besides my two brothers, to enter the Hampton Institute, I decided to spend some months in study at Washington, D.C. I remained there for eight months. I derived a great deal of benefit from the studies which I pursued, and I came into contact with some strong men and women. At the institution I attended, there was no industrial training given to the students, and I had an opportunity of comparing the influence of an institution with no industrial training with that of one like the Hampton Institute that emphasized the industries. At this school, I found the students, in most cases, had more money, were better dressed, wore the latest style of all manner of clothing, and in some cases were more brilliant mentally. At Hampton, it was a standing rule that, while the institution would be responsible for securing someone to pay the tuition for the students, the men and women themselves must provide for their own board, books, clothing, and room wholly by work, or partly by work, and partly in cash. At the institution at which I now was, I found that a large proportion of the students, by some means, had their personal expenses paid for them. At Hampton, the student was constantly making the effort through the industries to help himself and that very effort was of immense value in character building. The students at the other schools seemed to be less self-dependent. They seemed to give more attention to mere outward appearances. In a word, they did not appear to me to be beginning at the bottom, on a real, solid foundation, to the extent that they were at Hampton. They knew more about Latin than Greek when they left school, but they seemed to know less about life and its conditions as they would meet it at their homes. Having lived for a number of years in the midst of comfortable surroundings, they were not as much inclined as the Hampton students to go into the country districts of the South, where there was little of comfort, to work for our people, and they were more inclined to yield to the temptation to become hotel waiters and Pullman car porters as their life work. During the time I was a student in Washington, the city was crowded with colored people, many of whom had recently come from the South. A large proportion of these people had been drawn to Washington because they felt that they could lead a life of ease there. Others had secured minor government positions, and still another large class was there in the hope of securing federal positions. A number of colored men, some of them very strong and brilliant, were in the House of Representatives at that time and one, the Honorable B. K. Bruce, was in the Senate. All this tended to make Washington an attractive place for members of the colored race. Then, too, they knew that at all times they could have the protection of the law in the District of Columbia. The public schools in Washington for colored people were better then than they were elsewhere. I took great interest in studying the life of our people there closely at that time. I found that, while among them there was a large element of substantial, worthy citizens, there was also a superficiality about the life of a large class that greatly alarmed me. I saw young colored men who were not earning more than four dollars a week spend two dollars or more for a buggy on Sunday to ride up and down Pennsylvania Avenue in, in order that they might try to convince the world that they were worth thousands. I saw other young men who received seventy-five or one hundred dollars per month from the government, who were in debt at the end of every month. I saw men who, but a few months previous, were members of Congress, then without employment and in poverty. Among a large class, there seemed to be a dependence upon the government for every conceivable thing. 
the members of this class had little ambition to create a position for themselves, but wanted the federal officials to create one for them. How many times I wished then, and have often wished since, that by some power of magic I might remove the great bulk of these people into the country districts and plant them upon the soil, upon the solid and never deceptive foundation of Mother Nature, where all nations and races that have ever succeeded have gotten their start, a start that at first may be slow and toilsome, but one that nevertheless is real. In Washington, I saw girls whose mothers were earning their living by laundrying. These girls were taught by their mothers, in rather a crude way, it is true, the industry of laundrying. Later, these girls entered the public schools and remained there perhaps six or eight years. When the public school course was finally finished, they wanted more costly dresses, more costly hats and shoes. In a word, while their wants had been increased, their ability to supply their wants had not been increased in the same degree. On the other hand, their six or eight years of book education had weaned them away from the occupation of their mothers. The result of this was in too many cases that the girls went to the bad. I often thought how much wiser it would have been to give these girls the same amount of mental training, and I favor any kind of training, whether in the languages or mathematics, that gives strength and culture to the mind, but at the same time to give them the most thorough training in the latest and best methods of laundrying and other kindred occupations.